am Pastor Peggy Yetman from Slave Lake Wesleyan Church in Slave Lake, Alberta. And I'm Pastor Diane from Norfolk Wesleyan Church in Norfolk, New York. Welcome to Warm Hearted Wednesday. Well, the Pharisees had asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And uh, he replies to them, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And as, as we started into this whole COVID crisis, that we need to keep God central. And we need to keep that idea that, that we have to love God. So that's why we do our, our show at 12.30 Central Time. Because Mark 12.30 tells us to love God with all we have. And we remind you of this, especially on, on Wednesday, because the second commandment is to love our neighbors as ourselves. So this whole idea of loving God and loving others sums up what we're called to do. But it's a matter of the heart, isn't it? And the person that we have on today has a heart for church. Oh. Uh, he was the, the Wesleyan pastor in the bridge in Canada for many, many years. Uh, went on to do his doctorate work and then moved on to be the, uh, the, the pastor and the uh, professor at Kingswood University. Woo, 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 woo. <laughs> Uh, Kingswood University and uh, is the church planter pastoral ministries sort of head of the department and he's just recently become the national superintendent for the Wesleyan Church in all of Canada so and the are, state of Maine and the state of Maine sorry <laughs> Uh, so it is our pleasure today to welcome uh, doctors, Reverend Dr. Uh, Stephen Elliott. Well, it is uh, it is amazing to have you here. We're so thrilled that uh, you could come on. Um, and we're going to be talking today about uh, the evolving church, and I love I love these charts that you've done because I love I love charts. They they organize so well, um, but it would be easy to to say, "Oh, I'm in the small group, therefore I'm unhealthy." Is is that um, is that true? No, absolutely not. Um, a, a small church can be extremely healthy, and a very large church can be extremely unhealthy. And so, the size of the church has nothing to do with the health and vitality uh, of, of the the congregation and their ministries. Uh, but the backstory behind these charts uh, actually flows out of uh, my own experience that we were we were hitting about 125 and we were not growing past it. And I was at a, a pastor's conference up in Toronto and it was, it was very small, it was like 15, 20 pastors. And we brought in, in the district uh, one of the guest speakers and um, all of a sudden in the middle of his seminar, he just stopped and he said, how many marbles can you hold in your hand? And so I looked at my hands, and we all did, all the pastors. And I, I guessed, I don't know, I could probably hold like 40 or 50, maybe something like that. And then he said, um, what happens when another 10 marbles comes along? He said, at the end of the day, how many marbles are in your hands? And I said, well, you still got 40 or 50 marbles. And he said, if you want to have more marbles in your hand, or you, have, you want to have more marbles, what do you need to do? Quit holding them in your hand and go get a bucket. Oh. And I had a eureka moment. It was just like the lights went on and I realized the reason we were not growing past 125 is because the infrastructure of our church, how we actually do church, would not accommodate more than 125 people. So as a small example, things like um, pastoral care, you know, in a small church, the pastor usually is the one that's providing all the care. So if you've got five people in the hospital, you know, you make your five hospital calls because that's what you're able to do, plus your sermon preparation, plus your board meetings and all the rest of that kind of stuff. But what happens when you've got 10 or 15 people in the hospital? 
and you can only get to five of them, well then the five or ten that you did not visit, they feel like you don't care about them, they get mad at the church and then they leave. Well, what I didn't know at that point is I didn't know, well, what are those infrastructure issues that that really limit the, the potential growth of the church? And that put me into this whole study in, well, what is it that changes in the life of the church as it goes? I had this eureka moment, and it was actually very shortly after that. Uh, we had a, a visiting pastor at our church, and he was leading a church of about five or 600 people. We were running about 125. And I said to him, I said, tell me something that changes as the church grows. He told me a variety of things, but he told me two that, that I remember. He said, one of the things that changes as a church grows is the expectation in preaching changes. The expectation in preaching goes way up the larger the church is. And then the second thing this Baptist pastor said to me, he said, uh, your availability to the rank and file in the church goes way down, that your focus as a senior pastor is not on the congregation, it's on your staff. It's your staff and it's your lay ministry leaders that are providing care to the congregation. So uh, I've identified at least 33 things in the life of the church that significantly change um, as the church grows. And if they don't change, it will, it will hinder the, the growth of the church. How do they get people on board to be able to to move in that direction well one of the things that's really important is that you that a, a pastor does not jump two or three levels ahead so that's why in the charts i show a church of 125 or smaller 125 to 250 250 to 400 and 400 and above so i've identified those four different levels it would be disastrous for a pastor of a church of 125 to start functioning like a church of 600, the congregation would revolt. Uh, that the church board needs to understand why we're doing these things. Your key influencers in the church, whoever they are, whether they're board members or whether they're just uh, somebody else in the church that's like they've been there forever, um, they need to understand why we're doing these things. So when when somebody is in, let's let's say the the first level, the small church when should they start making a shift towards this the infrastructure in the next level should, obviously they shouldn't wait until they're at 125 should stuff be done before that um i i would i, I would i would look at the 33 charts and figure out which ones are the easiest ones to do they're going to cause the least amount of trauma in the life of the church you know that people are least likely to object to um, but i you know if we use that 80 percent rule like like when do you when do you go to a second service well you go to you don't go to the second service when you're full you go to the second service when you're around 80 percent full right yeah so if i was at some place around 90 to 100 i would be looking to start putting into practices the, the church of a 250. Um, so as I look through all these charts in, this is your upcoming book, which which is what again? What, what's the name of the book again? Called The Evolving Church, What Changes in the Life of the Church as It Grows. Um, well, I, I feel privileged that I actually have a copy of chapter six, so I'm like, yay. Um, you got the chapter so, what people would want. <laughs> <laughs> um, when, I, when I'm looking through it, what you would suggest for a pastor is like go through this because they're all so so um diversely named like public worship creativity uh noteworthy special church events all that kind of stuff that you would pick it an area like almost like take one page out and say this is what we're going to do right now and then maybe in like six months pick another one <laughs> Is that the kind of idea behind this? I think that would be very wise. I, I think, I think if it was me. I would try and choose something that I think is going to be the biggest bang for the buck. I right. We made these changes. I think it would have the potential to help us to reach and retain more people for Christ. And so that would be a local church decision, you know, because not every church is facing the exact same issues. If you were to give us one piece of advice 
um, for Diane, myself, and other people that find themselves in, uh, in a small church location, what would that one piece of advice be? Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I want to commend you because I think you're both doing wonderful work. And I believe that your hearts are in what you're doing. I think you've got, you've got wonderful locations where God's, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ is desperately needed. And so I, I commend you both. Um, I would say that probably one of the things that um, small churches need to give attention to first um, is, is the switching from pastoral care to congregational care. Um, I think that the sooner that a church can make that type of a change where it's not just the pastor that's providing the care, um, and it may only be one other person that helps carry the load a little bit. Um, the, one of the other things too is this whole issue of how we do discipleship. We, we, we primarily care, uh, lean into large like pulpit ministry and small group ministries. When we were transitioning into utilizing the seven uh, environments of discipleship, um, one of the first ones that we did was, was mentoring. And I passed a clipboard one Sunday through the congregation and I just said, is there anybody that would be interested in having a, a mentor? I was, I was totally blown away by how many people signed up. Like I thought if I got like five or six, maybe that, like I don't know what we would get, like 30 or something like that it was way more than I ever anticipated, you know? So we, we had to raise up some mentors. And so we, we took, you know, a bunch of people that we had some confidence in and I met with them and we trained them how to be a good mentor. And then we started matching them up. Well, all of a sudden, um, the base of our church for who is who is being discipled and helped to grow went from narrow to much broader. And so you know, the broadening the ways that we do uh, discipleship would be um, another one. Um, outreach events have got to be totally focused on the community, not, not doing something that just ministers to the church family. I mean, there's a place for church family, you know, suppers and things like that. Yeah. But the lion's share of outreach events are not effective because they're not really designed for uh, reaching unsafe people. And so, again, it's it's discovering what are the keys to the community? What is it that an unsafe person might value? Like like a CPR course or, you know, a, a course in how to work a defibrillator or anything, anything like that. Uh, fire extinguishing or hunting or something that they might be interested in. Yeah. Bring up something like that, which hopefully brings the person in the door or at least exposes them to the life of the church. And yeah. just bouncing off one other thing you said, Peggy, we know from from the studies, a single outreach event almost never brings somebody into the life of the church. Yeah. It takes at least two or three back to back because you get the person in the door for the Easter musical or the Christmas Eve service or something like that, but that does not establish a, pat, a new pattern of church attendance in their life. They need the very following Sunday, there needs to be something that would motivate them to get out of bed on a Sunday morning and to come to church the following Sunday and then the third Sunday. And the, the statistical evidence is if you can get a person to come three times in a row to your church on a Sunday morning, You've got like about an 85% likelihood that person will settle into you. How do you see the church evolving and changing in the next little while, or do you see that change? Yeah, I think the issue of mental health is going to be um, an increasing area of opportunity for the church to provide support to the community. Um, I think. Uh, it would be wise for churches to offer seminars or um, bring in an outside consultant. I'm not putting this on the pastor because we're, we're not omniscient and not all powerful, but bring in some people that, that understand um, issues of, of mental health and uh, provide some extra levels of support for, for those. Um, the opportunities for ministry, I think, are going to be growing around the issue of immigrant ministries, um, poverty, um, uh, abuse type of issues. I think there's such a crying need for the church to be involved 
and it's it's just it should be one of the strengths of the church um, jesus was constantly talking about how important ministry to the poor are and so i think in the in the go forward i think there will be more and more opportunities that the church needs to be aware of and, and capitalize on um, i think obviously our online presence i think that's important great and i think this is a great opportunity especially with our worship service you know we've taken a break from the in person as we you know work towards reopening re-meeting we can take that time to, to say okay uh creativity in a worship service how can i go to that next level and reopen with that new that new mindset yeah that's that's the pure interest to me i love creativity in worship services i if, if every sunday it's two hymns a chorus pastoral prayer announcements offering you know something and then the sermon and a closing hymn like that just drives me berserk <laughs> I, like i know we can be more creative than that and you know we've got some teenage girls in the church that would love to do a dance and we've got people that know how to do artwork and they could while we're singing they could be drawing a, a painting of, of the cross or something like that um, to do mime or object lessons or anything um, just anything that adds a creative element into the service i think is just helps to break the predictability of our services so yes that's definitely one of the traits of a church as it grows it that includes a creative element um, well, we have so much fun, you know, like we, we, we bring kids in and we have so much fun with them during like a week long VBS and we do all of these creative things. And then after VBS is over, you clean everything up and you go back to, you know, and if these same children come to, to church on Sunday morning, they're like, what happened to everything? So you introduce church to them in one way, and then you, but the reality is it's not nearly as much fun. And, and I think, I think God is kind of fun. So Dr. Elliot is, if you had one message that you'd want to send to, to all the pastors out there right now. The main thing I would say to our pastors is look after yourself, look after your own spiritual well-being. Um, do not neglect your own time in the word um, take time to go for a walk outside and, and look at the beauty of God's creation. The heavens declare the glories of God. What we've been known about God is clearly seen from what he's made. And so I would say to our own pastors and our own leaders, do not neglect your own spiritual well-being and your own walk with God. Uh, because ultimately, we minister out of who we are as a person. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Elliot, for coming on with us today. And uh, so from Slave Lake, Alberta, I am Pastor Peggy. From Sussex, New Brunswick, I'm Steve Elliot. And from Norfolk, New York, I'm Pastor Diane. We will see you tomorrow for a Tadpole Thursday. Until then, be safe. Be healthy. And be the church. Bye, everyone. Bye.